Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapur. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's always a pleasure to speak in this chamber. It's such a, always an honour to speak on behalf of the people of Calgary, Midnapur. As well, I uh, come here today as um, a, a, a proud woman who is one quarter Ukrainian, so it is an honour for me to be here today speaking um, not only for the people of Ukraine, but also my ancestors, in fact, who come from this incredible nation that is so challenged at this time. Madam Speaker, as you know, when I arrive in this chamber, it is always with a lot of thought uh, beforehand to the matter of the day and the opposition motion that we have here today. And so, as I come here, I, I wonder about the situation that we find this resilient nation in. Um, the same question comes to my mind that I ask for, for many of the world problems, many of the problems we have seen in our nation, in our nation recently. And that question is, how did it come to this? How did it come to this? Well, I'll give you some insight into that, uh, Madam Speaker, according to the research that I've done. Madam Speaker, if we look to uh, an article um, by Bill Browder um, of AFP, we will see that Russia has been a stagnant economy now with the most extreme wealth disparity of any major country and endemic hopelessness that infects mil millions of ordinary citizens, so not a great place from which Putin can begin. A New York Times article I have here, Madam Speaker, says, Mr. Putin has described the Soviet disintegration as a catastrophe that robbed Russia of its rightful place among the world's great powers and put it at the mercy of a predatory West. He spent his 22 years in power rebuilding Russia's military and reasserting its geopolitical clout. The Russian president calls NATO's expansion menacing and the prospect of, the U of Ukraine joining it as a major threat to his country. As Russia has grown more assertive and stronger military, his complaints about NATO have only grown more strident. Putin, Madam Speaker, also knows that the West has never really held him accountable for his past actions. Since 2008, he has invaded Georgia, taken Crimea, occupied eastern Ukraine, bombed hospitals in Syria, shot down a passenger plane, and hacked governments and businesses around the world. The West's response? A few sanctions, removal from the G8, and the expulsion of a mere handful of diplomats. How could this happen, Madam Speaker? Well, Canada, Madam Speaker, does in fact have a part. Let's look to the speech uh, from the throne, Madam Speaker, where it, it stated within there, this is the moment. This is the moment to fight for a secure, just, and equitable world. Yet what do we see? Yeah. What do we see? Well, we see this government's lack of action in Venezuela, no clear offer to mediate the conflict, ignoring the roles of Russia and China, who are scheming here together, potentially, for, for future, further action. Excuse me. We saw too little aid, too late, with Digest Venezuela recently saying that 96 percent of Venezuelans are living in poverty. In Saudi Arabia, Madam Speaker, we saw very similar disaction from this government against dictatorship, against lack of democracy, where the use of Twitter was used to speak against the kingdom following the imprisonment of civil society and women's rights activists. We, we saw this government aid with an export permit of $1.5 billion worth of arms, and yet they dragged their heels here, Madam Speaker, when it came to Ukraine. And they never spoke up, Madam Speaker, in December of 2008 with the murder of the journalist Khashoggi. Let's go to Hungary now, briefly, Madam Speaker, where Orban centralized power, weakened the rule of law, weakened academic freedom and press freedom, and the Trudeau government, excuse me, the Prime Minister's government refused to take a tougher stance against Orban. So again, I say it didn't have to come to this. Leading up to this, Madam Speaker, Canada should not have ignored its investment in Canada's military. Maintaining our NATO commitment to invest 2 percent on military spending should have been prioritized, but it never was, Madam Speaker. 
Our conservative 2021 platform called for intensifying Operation Unifier, Canada's armed forces military training and capacity building mission in Ukraine, supplying Ukraine with lethal weapons and reinstating the provision of radar sat imagery. Madam Speaker, my colleague who, who just spoke, uh, the member for Brandon Sears, indicated that this government has consistently had a lack of vision, a lack of foresight in protection not only of Canada, but the rest of the safe Western democratic world. This also, of course, Madam Speaker, is relevant when we speak about energy. Madam Speaker, you may have seen the Globe and, Ardo, 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 excuse me, Globe and Mail article by Conrad Yab, uh, Yakabuski, who, who said, Canada missed the boat during an LNG development boom a decade ago. It must not make the same mistake again. Yielding to pressure from environmentalists who oppose LNG export terminals and gas pipelines on the grounds that such developments prolong global defendants on fossil fuels or prevent Canada from meeting its own greenhouse gas reduction targets will only end up strengthening the hand of Mr. Putin and his fellow dictators. So you see, Madam Speaker, we are not using this opposition day motion to divide Canadians. We are giving Canada an opportunity to help the world, to defend the world with the use of our clean, safe, natural resources. But I wish I could say it ends there, Madam Speaker, with just Canada is not having done its due diligence, not having done its work in the world. It goes beyond that, Madam Speaker. Did you know, Madam Speaker, that Russia is currently a member of the International Court of Justice, the very international body which may try this leader and this nation for war crimes, as we are seeing? Madam Speaker, Russia also sits on the United Nations Economic and Social Council. How can that be, Madam Speaker, that this dictator is determining economic and social policy between nations for the entire world? Madam Speaker, uh, on the, the current membership of the Human Rights Council includes nations such as Eritrea, Bolivia, Cuba, Venezuela. I'll talk more about these nations in a momentarily, Madam Speaker, but they do not have um, a, a standard of excellence historically for supporting human rights. And of course, Madam Speaker, Russia is currently on the UN Security Council. Uh, unbelievable, Madam Speaker. So it is, it is not just Canada that has been derelict in its duty of holding this nation to account. It has is, it is stood beside other nations of the world who has let this happen. We saw this most recently with the draft resolution AES-11 uh, condemning the, uh, these actions in Ukraine. And it is true that dictators are standing with Putin. Belarus, North Korea, Eritrea, Syria, the United Nations, and, and, uh, 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 an organization that is to promote the safety and the well-being of, of the world has not done it, its work here. When it comes to the world and natural resources, Madam Speaker, I turn to an article by Stephen J. Blank entitled The Balkans and Euro-Atlantic Energy Security, where he states Russia's objectives in helping to foment this crisis are clear. They entail restoring our energy in its, its energy hegemony and political leverage over numerous European countries. In addition, the European Union recently released a report where it stated energy policy is often used as foreign policy tool, in particular in major energy producing transit countries. The Commission said as part of a revitalized Europe energy and climate diplomacy, the UN the EU excuse me will use all of its foreign policy instruments to establish strategic energy partnerships with increasingly important producing and transit countries or regions. And finally, the EU will continue to integrate Norway fully into its internal energy policies. The EU will also develop its partnerships with countries such as the United States and Canada. So, Madam Speaker, in conclusion, I will say Canada has failed in not allowing this situation to escalate, in not allowing this invasion to take place, and it is alongside the world. And so this government's 
idea that we are simply, anyone in this house's idea, the Bloc, the Green Party, the NDB, the idea that we are putting forward this only for our, our, our interests is untrue. We are standing today for natural resources, for the safety and security of Canadians, but also our rightful place in the world as a leader and protecting the safety and the security of the world as well, Madam Speaker. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Questions and comments. Questions et commentaires. L'honorable député de Mirabel. Honorable member for Mirabel. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I listened to my colleague's speech, and the conservative line today seems to be that energy policy is part of foreign policy. When I listen to their speeches, I interpret this in a different way. Are they not making, uh, using foreign policy to serve big oil? The honorable member for Calgary Midnapore. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank you very much to my colleague. You know, I sit here every day when the House is sitting, and all day long I listen to the Bloc's questions about the environment and their questions that target uh, the oil and gas industry. So they're saying that it's wrong to speak about oil and gas, but they are using oil and gas as a tool, a political tool, every day in this House. Thank you. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Uh, I am shocked with so many elements raised in this debate. Uh, this motion is like a wolf in sheep's coat. For the Conservatives to tout energy policy as foreign policy in the face of hum the humanitarian crisis uh, in the Ukraine is deplorable. Uh, I appreciate the need to have long-term strategies. However, we must do so with the same spirit and courage as the Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Does the member agree that if we ask the president how to assist his beautiful country and his beautiful people, that oil and gas expansion measures is the last thing that he would ask for? Member for Calgary, Midnapore. Well, I thank my colleague very much uh, for the question, and I've really enjoyed having her in the House as the new member uh, for Nunavut. But I would disagree um, with what she is saying. I believe that the president of Ukraine, a free and democratic nation would absolutely support our opposition motion here today and the idea to build uh, pipelines and, and methods of, of ways to get our, our ethically produced, clean, natural resources as a gift to all of the world, including his own nation. So I disagree with, with uh, this, this member. Indeed, I believe he would welcome this Opposition Day motion, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member for Sanex Gulf Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Honourable Member for Calgary, Mindapur, what she may believe President Zelensky wants is more likely to be consistent with what the Ukrainian lead of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said last week. Dr. Svetlana Krakowska said the root causes of the war in Ukraine and the root causes of the climate crisis are the same. Dependence on fossil fuels and Ukraine stands against them and for renewables. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapore. Uh, thank you very much to my colleague from Sandwich Gulf Islands. What this Opposition Day stands for and what our party stands for is what these other parties seem to be against, and that is freedom, that is democracy, right. that is world order, that is the rule of law. And guess what? When you have those things, you get better outcomes for the environment, you get better outcomes for women, you get better outcomes for minorities, and they should learn that. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member uh, for Sarnia Lenton. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for her great words. Uh, um, it's not just that we will do everything that we can to help Ukraine at this time, but I think our, our allies and friends in Europe would really appreciate, you know, something to back up the threat of their gas dependence and oil dependence that is now jeopardized. Would she not agree? The Honourable Member for Calgary, Bindapur. Thank you very much, um, Madam Speaker, and thank you to my incredible colleague from Sarnia Lambton for that question. And, and she is right, as I'm sure she has also read the uh, report from the EU, which states that uh, Eastern Europe needs to move beyond uh, its energy dependence from Russia. So my colleague's exactly on track with her line of thinking, uh, as well as that of the European as well, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. Please, Resuming debate.